-hmm. I think one of the most annoying things is when people who are not Latino try to lecture me um, about not knowing Spanish, and I'm like, really? yes, I get that a lot, surprisingly. My friend Alex was telling me a few weeks ago that he is a no sabo kid. So could you explain a little bit about what exactly that means? Yeah, so no sabo is technically the TikTok term for kids who grew up like second or third generation in America um, who don't speak a word of Spanish. Mm -hmm. uh, basically, um, they're very Americanized um, and they don't, they, they're, the joke is they're a little out of touch with their Latin culture, especially in the fact that like they don't know Spanish, so it's harder for them to communicate with other Latin speakers. So tell me a little bit about your upbringing then. Did you grow up in a Spanish-speaking household? So yeah, both my parents um, spoke Spanish. My stepdad and my mom both knew Spanish. My stepdad more so because his mother um, immigrated from Panama to here. So his, in his house, they knew a lot of Spanish. My mom, less so. Um, her Spanish is good, but her parents came from Puerto Rico, so they already knew a decent amount of English. And in their household, she mainly um, spoke English, and she took it upon herself to learn Spanish later on. My parents never really took it upon themselves to teach me Spanish, but I always knew, like, when they were speaking Spanish, I could, like, kind of pick up on what they were talking about a little bit here and there. Mm -hmm. But also knew if, like, they spoke in Spanish, I need to keep out of it. You know why they didn't teach you Spanish? Um, sometimes it's just about how easy it is to teach someone Spanish versus English. They both, um, like I said, they learned Spanish growing up, but they are also, like, second generation here. Yeah. So at home, they'll speak a lot of Spanish amongst family and stuff, amongst, like, friends and the majority of their lives at work, stuff like that. They mainly spoke English. So despite them knowing both languages, English was always the easier language for them. And as you just have more generation of kids, it's gonna, you're gonna pass on language like you know the easiest. And for my parents, that was English. That's a different perspective. I never really thought about that before. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that just, that's the case with a lot of like no Sabo kids. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you'll most likely find that they're second or third generation. Their parents knew more English than they did Spanish. Okay. And so they're, they're going to be more comfortable with teaching their kids English than they are Spanish. Like, did it feel really uncomfortable that you didn't know Spanish at all? In some instances, yes. Um, especially when interacting with, like, my older relatives. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of them would get very judgmental about the fact that I don't know Spanish. I think the, my worst case was um, when I used to work at Dunkin' Donuts. I used to get a lot of customers who spoke a lot of Spanish. And they saw me, they immediately thought they can speak rapid fire Spanish to me. <laughs> and they just start going off really fast. I'm like, hold on. I don't know a word of Spanish. They're like, but you look Spanish. <laughs> I am Spanish. I just don't know a word of it. No, I don't think you're really Spanish. And I'll get that all the time. People would say, you're not actually Spanish. You don't know Spanish. Right. And it's, it's a very like gatekeeping in a way of like Latin heritage and Latin culture. If you don't speak the language, then obviously you can't be Spanish. And so I got that a lot growing up. Did you grow up with uh, many other no Sabo kids when you were growing up? Oh yeah, I mean, I grew up in New York, so I knew a lot of people um, who were of Latino heritage. Um, a decent amount of them did speak Spanish. Um, and then there are those that definitely don't. And they were in, in the same boat as me, second or third generation, didn't know a word of Spanish. Their parents are mainly comfortable with English. English. Um, or either that, or they're kind of mixed. And so they had like one parent that was Latino, one who was like maybe white or, or black. Um, so one parent knew Spanish really well, but the other parent didn't. And okay. so it, it's kind of like a joint effort to teach a kid a language. And uh, did you ever take any Spanish classes when you're when you're in uh, school? Yeah, you know, you have to take them in middle school. Um, I took a little bit in high school and then like I took one college course. Um, it was funny because my first few years of high school, I ended up taking Latin instead of Spanish. Ah. And so my family gave me so much flack for it. Um, <laughs> and I'm just like, it's a part of the program that I was in. I was required to take Latin over any other language. Mm -hmm. So I was taking Latin instead of learning Spanish. And my family just never understood. I ended up transferring high schools. I went to a high school where they didn't have Latin. Um, and so I took Spanish instead. Um, but yeah, I did, you know, every kid has to take a language in school. So I took Spanish. And did you think it was difficult? Um, I mean, on a school level, no. I mean, it's it's simple study. Um remembering vocabulary words yeah um but definitely like i do know that like the way they teach it in school isn't the way to like, properly teach someone a language because mm -hmm. they teach it mainly so you can write it um or just it's a way or just like any like any type of type of school it's more so about memorizing than it is about actually learning it yeah um you're not learning conversational spanish you're not learning to sit down and talk to somebody that's mainly what you're going to use language for to talk not so much to write or take a test and so I, it was easy for me in terms of like getting a good grade um, but in terms of like actually learning a language, definitely not. And going into those classes, did you, I guess, did you learn a lot of new vocabulary or did you already have that from, from learning it at home? Um, I think I definitely learned more vocabulary in school than I did at home. Okay. Because <laughs> at, at home, it's definitely more just like absorbing words and not really knowing what they're meaning versus at school, you're getting the actual translation and getting the use of when you'd use this word or that word. 
Um, and nothing makes like going home and hearing certain things like in a song or what my parents say. I'm like, okay, I, I know that one word. <laughs> I know what my parents mean when they say that. I just can't translate the rest of the sentence. Was there a lot of bullying in between the no Sabo kids and uh, the Sabo kids? <laughs> um, for the most part, no. Um, every time I, I, I went to high school with someone who did know Spanish or didn't, um, they were very friendly, very chill. Um, if anything, like we joke around a little bit. There's one experience, I, I remember I had a job at a deli and one of my coworkers would speak Spanish and me and him were great friends. Um, and as great friends do, we roast each other all the time and we're constantly rude and mean to each other. I'd start um, saying all sort of obscenities to him and then um, and his comeback was, okay, but say it in Spanish. And I would just get so infuriated with him because I couldn't say it in Spanish. I couldn't curse him out in Spanish as much as I wanted to. What would you say your comprehension level was at when you were in high school uh, with your parents? Definitely very low. Like I said, if I learned it in school, I could probably like figure out the one word while, while I was at home. Otherwise, um, it was very low. I think I definitely comprehend more now just because like I kind of surround myself with more um, Latin culture and Latin language a lot more. Um, I'll Google some, I'm, I'm more willing to Google something now than I was back then. Uh, Especially when listening to like a certain song, I'm like, let me look up the lyrics for that song. Versus back then, I was very, in little ways, I was ignorant to it, so I didn't want to learn it, just as a, like, a, as a way to stick it to my parents, or stick it to, like, all my elders, you're like, you gotta learn, you're, you, you know, shame on you for not learning, so I was like, no, I don't want to learn. Yeah. But definitely now, I, I comprehend it a lot more. Do you still get a lot of that type of shame being put on you? Definitely. People? Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, I, I, especially, I go out dancing a lot. Um, I, I've recently, like, found a passion for dancing with salsa, when I gave a shot to, um, and so you're definitely gonna get a lot of people trying to speak Spanish to you. Mm -hmm. And so every now and then someone talks to you to try to compliment you or just try to ask you for dance. You're like, what, huh? I don't speak the language. And so then you get the whole lecture, of, oh, why don't you know Spanish? And then you're just like, yeah, my parents never taught me. Um, so it's it's always gonna be part of my life until the day I die, unless I actually learn Spanish. Um, but yeah, you know, just something you kind of just like shrug off. Do you have any plans of learning Spanish? Um, learning lang a language is a huge task, and as much as I, as I would love to, um, I don't know if I can fit in my busy schedule. Mm -hmm. um, if I definitely, if I ever have a time period where like I don't have a lot going on, I'll more than love to pick up pick up a, a language, pick up Spanish. But it's kind of like picking up a new hobby. You gotta find time for it, um, and you gotta take. It takes time to learn something new, to learn a new skill, and so you gotta find a lot of time to dedicate to that. And how how exactly did you start to have this passion for Latin dance? How did that all start? Um, I think I've always been curious about it because one thing about growing up Latino is you always have the big house parties that you go to, <laughs> and um, you're expect everybody's expecting to go out and dance. I was once again the rebel. I was one who's like, I'm gonna stick it to my elders. I'm not gonna dance. I don't like dancing. Okay. In actuality, it was I didn't have the confidence to dance. I didn't have the confidence to ask someone to teach me. So within the past year, um, I decided, you know, um, thanks to the encouragement of like my parents, my dad especially, uh, he's been pushing me to learn for so long. Um, he just said, hey, go to some dance classes, learn the basics, try to see if you like it. Um, and I've always been curious about learning how to dance. Um, and i am just been more so in the past like year or two finding that confidence. Yeah. And so, I've been going out for the past year, been taking dance lessons, um, looking stuff up on YouTube, and meeting just a great group of friends who like have the same passion for dancing and who just want to go out and have a good time. And do you feel like you are more connected to Latino culture from, from dancing? Definitely. The, one of the biggest parts for me of Latino culture growing up was definitely the music. The music. Um, even if I didn't dance it, I did still always enjoy listening to it whenever my parents would blast it in the car, while we were cleaning, when I heard it at the parties. <laughs> it's always like there's always a song that like, I connected to, even at the time I, didn't, I wanted to ignore it. There was yep. always one or two songs where like I connected to, I really liked it. There's a couple songs whenever I hear it at the club. Um, I gotta dance it because that was my childhood song. So I grab any lady that's next to me, like, we're dancing this song no matter what. This is my childhood song. <laughs> and if you don't mind sharing, what are those, uh, your favorite childhood songs? Um, there's like three that pop in my head. Um, um, Promise by R Romeo Santos and Usher. Uh, the only reason why I liked that song was because Usher was in it. <laughs> um, and so that was the only the song I wanted to listen to. Um, El Preso. Um, that's another one that like, that's just like the defining salsa song of my childhood. Mm. And I'm going to butcher the pronunciation of this, but Uralis by Oscar Leon. Okay. Um, the, like that song, um, I always heard at every party I went to. That's not, that's just the salsa song I associate with my childhood. So th those three songs are my go-tos. And, uh, what genres of music were you listening to as, as a child? It varied. Um, I was very all over the place. I'm still all over the place. <laughs> um, as a, like growing up and like all the way from like elementary school to high school, I was very big. It's like hip hop, whatever was like on the radio, um, 
I was a big Little Wayne fan when I was 10 for some reason. And then as I got like into my latter years of high school and into college, I started listening a lot more to like classic rock or heavy metal. Any, any sort of just like fast, aggressive song. I don't know where my parents were, like, they don't understand how it happened. <laughs> um, I don't know where I was, I was over here. When I was 10, I wanted to be a rapper. Then when I was 18, I was like, I want to go into a mosh pit and listen to Slipknot. And then just like in the past like year or so is when I really just started listening to more to like Latin music, um, trying to get more in touch with my culture and just enjoy dancing a lot more. What Latin celebrations, events, or just kind of, you know, parties in general really stick out to you from your childhood? Um, definitely like the one big thing that always stuck out was the Puerto Rican Day Parade. My, um, my mother's Puerto Rican. Mm. And so watching that on the news every year was big. I got to go one year when I was 20. Um, yeah, it was. I was 20 years old when I went for the first time and it was an amazing experience. Um, I definitely want to go again. That, that's definitely big every, every year, especially because it always lined up with my birthday. Okay. Uh, it was always <laughs> right around the time of my birthday. And so doing that was, was really great. I know like, I mean, just saying like Thanksgiving and Christmas is big. It's all over, big all over America. Um, but in Latino cultures, like certain things hit a little different, mm -hmm. um, certain foods. Um, I remember the, my biggest memories are the, like the huge, basically we work like factory workers to make pastelas. Um, and so one person would be like grinding something, one person would be like putting some sauce or wrapping something up, putting in the meat. Um, and we'd be doing that for hours in order to get that done. <laughs> uh, because you would have to make enough, not only to last you for Thanksgiving, but yeah. also for Christmas. Really? And so you're making all this in early, in mid-November, so you can last it all the way to the end of December. Oh, you had to explain to me what a pastel is, I have no idea what that is. A pastel is, if the best, um, the best thing I can connect it to or tie it to is like a tamales. Um, okay. It's kind of like that, but it's the Puerto Rican version. Um, it, you know, you just, you, I don't know what specifically goes into it. Um, I'm such a no complicated. I don't even know what goes into pastel is. <laughs> um, you guys put some video over this of like of it being maybe grinded up some like yuca um, and you know just all types of stuff. And then you put all that in the pastel is, um, you wrap it up, you boil it, um, and then you make a big batch that lasts you for Thanksgiving all the way until Christmas. Really? Yeah, so that was big. Um, what's big in Latino houses is um, Christmas Eve. Christmas Eve. The running joke amongst Latinos is that like you do all your big celebrations on Christmas Eve, you you do Christmas Eve <laughs> dinner, you know, every the entire family comes over, Christmas Day comes, you open up your presents, and Christmas is over by like nine o'clock. <laughs> nine o'clock Christmas morning, Christmas is done. I know most people they do Christmas dinners. Yeah. <laughs> I've never I've never done a Christmas dinner. I've always done Christmas Eve dinner. And maybe I've done like one or two Christmas dinners, but for the most part my family celebrates on Christmas Eve, go to bed, wake up, open presents, that's it, Christmas is done. I like that schedule, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very convenient schedule. It does sound very convenient. <laughs> Especially because it gives me all Christmas Day to play with my toys. One thing that's big in every Latino party, you're always going to celebrate your kids. Um, but you're not having a party for the kids. You're having a party for the adults. It's just any excuse to celebrate. <laughs> any excuse to party, to drink, and to dance. Okay. And so I've been to so many one-year-old birthday parties where they're not going to remember a thing that happens. They're going to fall asleep halfway through this party. And yet all the adults are having a blast. They're having a great time. They're drinking. They're dancing. They're just having so much fun. I remember when I was eight years old, um, I wanted a Power Rangers themed birthday party. And I got that for the most part. Um, but by the time all, all of my friends left, uh, my family was still around. The music was blasting. Everybody's dancing. Everybody's drinking. I was in bed by 10 o'clock, I think. And we were in a very small house. So it's not like, you know, you would think it's kind of hard to fall asleep in that. Um, it was a very small house. Music was blasting. I got tired. I fell asleep. The party kept going until I think two in the morning. Um, and so that's when it's clear, it's like the party, at some point, the party stopped being for me and it was just an excuse for everybody to have a good time. It's something pro I'm probably going to pass on to any future kids I have. We'll have <laughs> we'll keep the tradition we'll, going on. <laughs> you know, we'll have a, a, a birthday party for his first birthday. We're going to yeah. put him to sleep very early and we're just going to keep dancing and drinking. <laughs> Sounds like a good plan. <laughs> Sounds like a fun plan. All right, man, let's talk about some more Puerto Rican dishes and drinks and things like that, because I don't know anything about them. But uh, yeah, tell me what what are your what are your favorite drinks and favorite mm. Puerto Rican foods? Okay, in terms of foods, um, I definitely arroz con habichuelas, arroz con conduras, any sort of rice and beans is is amazing. Um, my go-to is always white rice with um, habichuelas because I just I love the sauce. I love how it, how it um, kind of like covers the white rice and gives it flavor. Okay. Um, so I, I ate a lot of that growing up. Um, Pani, I'm butchering that pronunciation, uh, but it's basically like a roast pork. Um, I've cooked it once mm. myself. I'm still working on how to like make it come out really good, um, but it's it's this roast pork. You you stab it a lot, and then you take all the seasoning, you mix it up in a bowl, and you pour it into the stab the stab holes, and you pour it on top, and you let it sit for 24 hours. Next day, you throw it in the oven. 
um, comes out. It's amazing. That's definitely something that's big on Christmas Eve dinners. Okay. Um, Eve dinners. I talked earlier about pasteles. I'm going to be honest. I'm going to get a lot of hate for this because I always do. I don't like pasteles. I never like the taste of it. Um, but it's something that my family's always loved. Um, it's, I'm always going to be part of the factory that makes it um, whenever I go help out for Thanksgiving. Um, yeah, there's just there's so many good Puerto Rican dishes. Um, Mufungo. The, the platanos. Um, it's a kind of like, it's fried platanos, but like in a, they kind of like ball it up and they put some stuffing in there. Um, hmm. that's amazing. Um, so that's something I really love, but yeah, there's just, there's, there's a lot of really great Puerto Rican food out there. Arroz con pollo, that's a basic one, but it's, it's so okay. good with the right seasoning. It's just amazing. I've never had Puerto Rican food before. I, well, maybe I have, but I just, mm -hmm. I never knew that it was Puerto Rican food, you know? Yeah. So that's I know a great restaurant, restaurant I can take you to. I so, <laughs> uh, how about drinks now? Um, one thing that was big, um, that my parents used to buy a lot is, a uh, Goya Malta. It's uh, some sort of, like, malt drink. Um, okay. yeah, it's, it, the bottle is very distinguishable. Like, my parents used to buy it all the time. Yeah. Um, they, yeah, they loved that. Um, so they bought it a lot. I tried it a couple times as a kid. Um, it's okay. I couldn't, it's, it's a bit of an acquired taste, so it wasn't 100% for me. I probably like it more now as an adult, um, than I did as a kid. Um, but yeah, that's, that was the one big drink other than, like, Corona. So what what other aspects of you know Latino culture do you really identify with? What do you say? Um, definitely like the biggest aspect I identify with is just like the closeness to family. Closest to family. Um, family is just like a big part of Latino culture, and like you're gonna go through like tough times with them, you're gonna go through great times with them, but no matter what, family is always there to support you. Um, and I've always felt supported by my family. Um, and anytime you get all of us together, all the cousins, all the aunts and uncles, the grandparents. Um, it's always just a great big time. We're always catching up, we're dancing, we're drinking, we're having a really fun time. Um, and so, yeah, just m some of my fondest memories are just spending time with my family. So living in the United States, for me, I've heard uh, a lot of stereotypes about Latinos and Latino mm -hmm. culture. I want to know, what do you think about those? Do you think a lot of them are true or a lot of them are not true? Um, it varies. Um, I mean, stereotypes always come from someplace that's harmful. Um, they always come from a place where um, it's like trying to like pick one characteristic of a culture and try to like exaggerate it or just try to come up with something that's not true in order to bring somebody down. Um, I think like one of the worst stereotypes that hurt me as a kid, um, the big one is that like every Spanish speaker is, is expect every every Latino person has to automatically know Spanish like it's a superpower. Mm -hmm. I talk a lot about how I get um, like lectured by people who, who do speak Spanish. Yeah. Um, and that can be annoying, but at least I understand that from like a cultural perspective. Mm -hmm. I think one of the most annoying things is when people who are not Latino try to lecture me um, about not knowing Spanish, and I'm like, really? yes, I get that a lot, surprisingly. Wow, and surprised. I've never seen them go up to someone who's like Italian or Chinese and say, why don't you know your home language? Um, I, for some reason, I'm the only one that ever gets that, and I will, I will rip into them. I'll be like, <laughs> you have no right to lecture me if you don't know your language either, so leave me alone. Um, but I do get that a lot. There's always also like the harmful uh, uh, stereotypes of like, oh, they're probably illegal. They're probably like came here undocumented. I mean, that's not true for me. Um, and that's not true for a lot of people. Um, but of course, that's like the first thing you want to jump to. Or even I get people who look at me, they just immediately assume I don't speak English, even though that's the only language I know. Um, and it, it's something that does annoy me. Um, I, I'll have a customer come up to me sometimes and be like, do you speak English, by the way? I'm like, wow. of course, I work on the front lines of this job. Of course, I know English. But of course, I got to deal with all that. I think yeah. more so, because I'm, I'm so Americanized, I don't get hurt by those stereotypes as much. I think I get more so angry on behalf of like other people who are like first generation immigrants. And then they had to deal with any sort of like racism or stereotypes. Um, I've had coworkers who have had to deal with flag for speaking Spanish at the workplace or not knowing enough English. And so I'll just get annoyed with the customer like, hey, listen, like you have some empathy here. This, you know, English isn't her first language. She's more comfortable with Spanish. Just because they're speaking Spanish doesn't mean they're saying something about you behind your back. I had one customer um, when I used to work at the deli job. Um, he just did not get along with one of my coworkers. And they were just constantly, you know, it got to the point my coworker said, I can't help him anymore. I, like, she had to take herself out of the picture. Like, if this guy comes in, I'm not going to help him. I need somebody else to help him because he just gets under my skin purposefully. And so well, at one point, she's speaking Spanish to another coworker. Um, and my, my Spanish wasn't the greatest, but from what I can understand, it was, I can't help him, I have issues with him. That's all she said. And so she walks away, take, decides to take a break right then and there. And he's coming up to me, he's saying, what did she say? What is she saying about me? I'm like, sir, she's not talking about you. She's just saying that she's taking a break. That's all. 
and he goes and he reports to the manager saying that you know oh this 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 coworker this this employee said i effing hate this guy and blah 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 manager comes up to me tries to figure out what, what's happening and i'm like dude that's not at all what she said he's taking advantage of the fact that she's speaking in a foreign language to make things up mm-hmm. in actuality what she said was i can't help him i have issues with him i'm taking my break and he tried to blow this all out of proportion and he knew he knew he could get away with it easily because she didn't her english wasn't the greatest her, her english was very good she was one of the easiest people for me to communicate with when it came to like english um but she like she knew he knew it wasn't her first language um, and he tried to take advantage of that fact to make things up about her to say she was saying things behind his back. Have you had any other moments throughout your life where you where you had to interpret uh, between English and Spanish, or you know, or at least like you yeah. know, facilitate some form of communication, kind of like in this case here? Um, I always get pressured into that spot, uh, which is funny because that's where I get to the point where people think speaking Spanish is a superpower. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> one of my experiences when I was seventeen, um, I had my first job. And my manager knew all Spanish, and this cu- customer comes in asking questions, but she only knew Spanish. And so he comes up to me and says, Alex, I got this lady, she only knows Spanish. So I'm like, okay, I don't know a word of Spanish. I don't, I'm not, I don't know the language. Okay, but at least try. I'm like, I mean, I don't think I'm going to learn Spanish in just a second. It's not a, like a superpower that I unlock by just trying. Yeah. Which is funny because afterwards, this same manager, a couple of minutes later, uh, started giving me a lecture about how I need to learn Spanish because it's my language. Keep in mind, this guy's not Spanish at all. And his go-to is, he says, mm-hmm. you see, my wife, she's Dominican. My kids, they're Dominican too. They know Spanish. They're Dominicano. And just like that moment right then and there, I was like, that didn't sit right with me at all, the way he just like explained that to me, like put that pressure on me. Mm-hmm. And it's funny because it, it didn't click to me why that felt so wrong until like a year later, the movie Get Out came out. Yeah. And it's mainly about the black experience, about like, you know, the whole like white liberalism. Um, but that movie, when, when he's dealt a lot with, like, people saying, I would have voted for Obama for a third time, or, you know, just generalizing stereotypes that, like, they think is, isn't harmful, but in actuality is, I think, like, when that movie came out, that made me realize, like, what that interaction was, mm-hmm. and, like, that kind of, like, neo-aggression that that movie d- displayed, that made me realize, like, that was that, what that interaction was, it was some sort of, like, neo-aggression, he thought he was being nice, in actuality, yeah. he was, like, stereotyping and putting me down for, like, not knowing my culture. So I remember I saw that movie, Get Out, and that's when I learned about a lot about neoaggressions and stuff. And so um, I see that movie. The next day, I'm talking to my mom about the movie. And I ask my mom, I'm like, hey, mom, do you ever have to, like, deal with any sort of, like, neoaggression? She goes on this whole spiel. How people talk about how they love Puerto Ricans and they love Puerto Rican hair. I want to have a baby with a Puerto Rican so that baby can have good hair. And people, people think these are compliments. People think these are, like, nice things to say. But in actuality, it's like, no, you're just being a bit of a weirdo. Like, that's a little racist what you just said right there, so. Has anybody else in your family shared similar experiences like this? Um, definitely my dad growing up in the neighborhood he grew up in. Um, he definitely experienced a little bit of racism. Um, it was just a lot of cultures clashing in his neighborhood. Culture clashing. Because um, it, was, it was very much like a impoverished neighborhood. Um, it was, like, predominantly, like, African-American and, like, a smaller percentage of, like, Latinos. So there's definitely a little culture clashing there. His story growing up was that everybody expected him to be Puerto Rican. They only knew, like, Puerto Ricans and Mexicans. And so he'd be like, no, I'm Guatemalan and I'm Salvadorian. People were just so confused. And, <laughs> like, there's, one of those. <laughs> there's more. <laughs> and so he, he experienced a lot of that. Um, I also think just, like, in general, uh, most people who aren't familiar with Latin cultures immediately think, like, Mexico or Puerto Rico. Yeah. Um, there's, like, even though there's, like, a whole pool of it. Um, definitely, like, um, I know my parents, a couple years ago, they traveled to Puerto Rico. Um, my, my, my mom and my stepdad, and they're both Afro-Latino, so they're the black and they're Latino. And one thing that, that, that can kind of be big in, Af- in Latin cultures is downplaying like the African roots of it. Mm-hmm. And especially when they see someone who is black, um, they'll try to speak to them in English, and they're like, oh no, but I'm Latino, I'm like really fluent in Spanish, I'm really good at this. Um, but they want, want to acknowledge that Latino side of them. So tell me more about how exactly you learned about this clash of culture within the, the Latino community. Because, of course, you do have some firsthand experience. But did you, I don't know, study it anywhere else or, you know? Yeah, in terms of, like, cultures, cultures clashing, um, I mean, you're always going to get, especially in America, a mix of, like, different cultures and different communities. Absolutely. Um, one thing that, like, I experienced a lot growing up was, like, marrying out, like, still within a Latino community, but also, like, within a separate Latino community. Um, my parents, my mom is Puerto Rican, my dad's Guatemalan and Salvadorian. Um, and so they obviously, they had me, who was a Puerto Rican, Guatemalan, Salvadorian mix. 
Um, my mom went on to marry a Panamanian man, um, and so I learned a, little, a lot about like Panamanian culture, specifically like Panamanian foods. Okay. Uh, I mean, the culture itself is very similar to like a lot of other Latino cultures with like some minor differences. Um, the main thing was like carnival. Um, I learned a lot about growing up I would, by watching YouTube videos that my stepdad would put on. Um, and then like from which country carnival? Uh, from Panama. From ba okay, from Panama. Yeah. Um, and then obviously, you know, gr I grew up learning about a lot about Puerto Rican culture, and then I'll go visit my dad's side of the family, learn more about like Guatemalan and Salvadorian culture, and then even I'll have cousins who are like, Colombian, and be and because one <laughs> uncle married a Colombian woman, and now I got a bunch of Colombian cousins. I'm learning wow. about <laughs> Colombian culture and Colombian food. My dad's like, you gotta learn how to dance cumbia because da Colombians love dancing cumbia. I'm like, I've never heard of cumbia. What is this? And then I learned how to dance cumbia. Um, so cultures come together in different ways. You find like the similarities. You find the differences. Um, in some ways, there are some sort of like um, like rivalry. Some sometimes, sometimes there's like racism within Latino cultures or just little stereotypes. Um, but for the most part, like I, in my experience, I've gotten along with a lot of people from other different Latin cultures, whether it be like Mexican, Dominican, Panamanian, Colombian. Um, we just kind of like find that similarity, especially if you know how to dance. Um, <laughs> because I can't communicate with you in Spanish, but I can dance. We can dance <laughs> together. So we find we find that common ground, or in terms of food. Because um, I love any sort of like Spanish food, whether it be Mexican food, Puerto Rican food. Um, I'm particular to anything in the Caribbean, so Cuban Caribbean. and Dominican also, because it's so similar to Puerto Rican food. Oh, really? Yeah, because um, uh -huh. they're neighbors, so they're, they're yeah. in many ways they're similar. Um, so I'm very particular to like Caribbean Spanish food. Um, but yeah, you just you kind of find your way around because like despite the fact that we're from different countries, different nationalities, um, we're still Latino at heart. We still we still mm -hmm. you know that's a lot of big love. We love. The food, we love to dance, we love to party, we love to celebrate. So you, you find that common ground there. Have you visited any countries in Latin America? Um, I've been to Mexico. I'm on a cruise. Um, the beaches there are very nice. They're very beautiful. Um, I'd love to go there for like more of a long trip. Yeah. Um, the last time I was in Puerto Rico, and this is sad, is um when I was four years old. Four. Okay. And I have very like small memories about it. Um, but I do remember like you know I do remember like the environment there, the tropical environment there. That's mainly what stuck out to me. Um, and like the, the way the houses were built, they're very different from like Americanized houses. Um, my big dream as of right now is to go to Guatemala for Christmas. Me and my dad have been talking about it for years. I was supposed to go two years ago, um, but then the pandemic happened. And so that kind of canceled any sort of travel plans. Um, but that's my, that's my next big goal to go to Guatemala for Christmas. And cause over there, I hear it's a party, there's fireworks, there's dancing, there's drinking. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a big uh, festival and I'm, I really want to go there someday. I love how you are just so passionate about your Latino heritage in your Latino culture and not letting the fact that, you know, you don't speak Spanish cloud your, your pride for your culture. Yeah, I mean, it's just a matter of like, you know, I know where I come from. I know where my ancestors came from. I know where my grandparents came from. I know how hard they worked to get here. Mm -hmm. but I also know how much they appreciate their culture. They appreciate their homeland. And I'm just trying to carry that on and pass that on. Um, if I ever do have kids, I want to pass on that love and that appreciation to, to my kids. Um, I want them to know the same love that I have for the food, that I have for the music, for the dancing. Um, the same way my parents wanted to pass a lot of that on to me. Granted, I was a bit stubborn as a kid, but I got older, I learned, and I appreciated a lot more what they were trying to teach me um, about my culture, about the food, and about the music and the dancing. And that's something I'm going to carry with me for the rest of my life. So if you have kids one day, what, what are some things about your culture that you really want to instill in them? I think definitely the food. I mean, yeah, as a parent, you got to feed your kid. It's like <laughs> your legal obligation and your moral <laughs> obligation. Um, so if I am going to feed them, they're going to, you know, grow up eating the arroz con habichuelas, arroz con gandulas, arroz con pollo, some papusas, um, all the stuff that I love eating as a kid. Um, I definitely want to pass on the Saturday morning cleanings, blasting salsa music. Uh, that's always a fun part. Um, your kids are going to complain, but then they'll grow up to do the same thing as you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And I definitely want to teach them more about dancing, give them some of the confidence that I didn't have growing up. Mm -hmm. And that's, that would be like the main thing um, I want to teach them is like have confidence in the way you dance. Have, it's okay to mess up. It's okay to ask to learn a new move. It's okay to be off rhythm every now and then, just as long as you're just going out there and having a good time. What piece of advice would you give to any of the No Sabo kids who may be watching, or not just kids, but you know, adults, whoever, No Sabo people in general who may be watching this video? I mean, the advice that I'll give is just, like, you're not any less Latino than anybody else um, who does speak Spanish. Um, the same blood runs through your veins. Um, you still have the same experience, the same connection to your culture. Um, you're going to go through some of the same experiences. 
Um, and don't don't feel shy in order to explore your culture more. Even if you don't know the language, you can still learn the history. You can still learn the food, still learn the, the music and the dancing. Um, that All that's in your blood. That's all stuff that you've inherited from your family, from your ancestors. So don't be shy to explore any of it. If somebody gives you slack for not knowing Spanish, no, shrug it off because everybody's going to get in your case about it. Even if you do learn Spanish, it's not going to be good enough. You're going to say your accent is wrong, your pronunciation is wrong, the way you conjugate a word is wrong. You're always going to get some sort of flack for something. Just have pride in who you are, have pride in your culture, and explore it to its full, fullest extent because Latino culture is a beautiful thing. Thank you very much for your perspective. This has been an absolutely amazing conversation. I love hearing your story and just learning a lot more about Latino culture. Of course, it was my pleasure. I'm glad you I'm glad you asked me to be on this interview. Thank you all for watching this video. Y hasta luego. Hasta la pasta. <laughs>